that I have from Genesis was, you know, it's a sequel, right? It's standalone, you can read it by itself, but it's a sequel. And the question is, how do you organically expand the world so that it's interesting for people? You don't want to give the, you don't want to like deliver the same meal twice, right? We we already sort of watched the progression of the robots all the way to this point. And you know, one thing I hate about uh, sequels is that so often what they'll do is it'll be the exact same thing again, except they decided, you know, we're going to raise the stakes. Instead of having one bad guy, we're going to have three bad guys, right? And it's like, no, that doesn't make it any better. It's the same thing, it's just three bad guys. So, you know, where I went with this was, I thought of Robotocalypse as really exploring the physical forms of all the machines. So, there are spider tanks and exoskeletons and tall walkers and, uh, you know, the, the parasites that mount the corpses. And, um, there's all kinds of gross stuff. I remember when I thought of that. I was in the shower and I was like, oh yeah, it's going to be so gross. You've got to climb up the bodies and they go stand up. Oh, my favorite. Um, so, so, that was very physical. And then later, you know, with Robogenesis, I thought, how do I organically expand this world? And I decided to go on to the mental side. You know, I spent a lot of time studying AI. And so, in this novel, I think more about, and I expand on the world of, of the AI. So we have Arcos R14, and he may be an enemy of humankind, or he may be trying to save humankind. It's sort of hard to tell. Um, but what interested me about expanding and bringing in more AIs is this notion that they don't form a natural class the way a species does. So all the animals that belong to the same species have traits in common. And that's not true for AI. So if you build, uh, if you train up an AI on different sets of data, then you'll have a different outcome. If, you, if it operates on different architecture, you know, different hardware, then you'll have a different entity. And so I thought, you know, what's the range of AI that we could have? There could be AI that don't even know human beings exist. Uh, there could be AI that know about humans, but don't understand humans. And there could be AI who know what it's like to be a human being and sympathize and empathize with us. And so that's really where I went with Robogenesis in terms of expanding everything. And that can kind of sound a little cold and technical, right? It's like, oh, we just made more robots. Well, that's how I normally talk when I'm not giving a presentation. Um, so, what I found was it was the opposite. Because the smarter these machines are, the better they are at manipulating human beings. And the way that you manipulate human beings is through emotion. It's through love and hope and, and cultural things like religion and belief systems. And it's really, what I, what I ended up having were machines that were almost more human than the human characters, because they understood humanity better than we understand ourselves, and they use it, you know, uh, to, to manipulate people. And so I'm going to actually read a little piece of uh, Robogenesis that sort of illustrates that point. And you guys remember in the first book, Cormac Wallace finds a cube, a thinking cube, that's got some, like, AI inside of it, and that's how he sort of tells that story. And uh, this has kind of a similar um, AI that's trapped inside a piece of hardware. And this is... Uh, a lot of what happens with Robogenesis is it's the story of Grey Horse Army marching back home to Grey Horse, um, which, by the way, is in central Oklahoma, which is kind of where I grew up. And this time I actually went to the Osage Nation and met the chief and, like, checked out the three villages and went to Grey Horse and just took notes about everything and, and apologized to everybody for blowing it up and all my novels and killing everybody. Um, <laughs> And apparently, also in Roman Apocalypse, I said that the Osage women looked like men but wearing dresses. <laughs> they noticed that I said that. that did not <laughs> I don't remember writing it. I think it, my editor might have slipped that in. That's probably not me that did that. This is the story of uh, Hank Cotton, and he's a, an Osage soldier, and he's in the. He's still in Alaska. He's in the woods, and he's um, he's about to march home. Uh, you guys might remember Hank. He had a bit part in Rule Apocalypse. In that first scene, when Lonnie Wayne Blanton gets on a, you know, makes himself a bologna sandwich with a pickle and then goes to Grey Horse uh, when everything's going wrong and his buddy gets run over by his Cadillac, uh, they have to decide whether to allow uh, a Cherokee, Lark Ironclad, to come into their, uh, to come into their place of refuge. And Hank Cotton is the guy who says. 
forget it, get him out of here. Um, so Hank's not the most sympathetic guy. Something metal clinks in the trees behind me, and now my gut is speaking to me real clear. Hustle up, fat boy, is what it's saying. You got to daydreaming here in the woods and forgot that there's murder among the trees. I spin around, rifle butt French kissing the meaty part of my shoulder. My eye is off the scope while I search for whatever made that noise. That's why I'm able to catch the flash of movement in my peripheral vision. It's a light quadruped, wolf size and damaged. I hear the clink again now that it's moving fast. It's had a bullet put through it at some point. Must have learned something from the experience because it keeps running off into the trees. I just about get a bead on it before it's gone. My cotton patrols don't use the radio for obvious reasons, and I can't risk calling out in case I attract more attention. It's important I stay hidden. Some of these leftover quads have serrated forelimbs like steak knives. They'll tear through your chest armor in the first lunge, and a second later they've got plated rear feet up and scrabbling to disembowel you. One quad might be a nice dance, but two or more as a party you should regretfully decline. I stalk a few feet into the trees, place each bootstep careful and fast. My eyes open so wide they feel tight in the chilly air. The walker moves, leaving plain tracks, scraping like a drunk against an occasional tree trunk. It might be a wandering mapper variety, or it might have been part of the hunting pack, I don't know. But if it's really wounded, then I've got a singular chance to put it down before more can come join it. And if it's got friends, then I'm most likely a dead man walking. For the next ten minutes, it's just me and my breath and the frostbit rifle stock pressed against my numb cheek. God forgive me, but I didn't think this went all the way through. It seemed broken and slow, but the walker must have accelerated. The trail is gone. This is an ambush, no doubt about it. I knew better than to hunt Rob. We all of us who fought the machines know better. You don't hunt Rob, he hunts you. I'm reaching for the radio to get some help and damn the consequences. When I realize that maybe, just maybe, I'm not the dumbest son of a bitch on the planet. Maybe I'm the smartest, or at least the luckiest anyway. The thinking cube is wedged in half-melted snow at the base of a tree, about ten yards away winking at me in cotton candy colors that stand out in the dark woods. It's the size of a child's block, and as I get closer, I can see that their keen colors are sort of floating away from the surface a few inches. The thing itself is pupil black. It's a brain box that must have dropped out of a big finger. And it's still functioning. Even if it's broken out here in the snow, I can't believe my luck. We found a handful of these over the course of the whole war. A white boy soldier named Cormac Wallace even found one with a whole Rob War Diary in it. I backsling my rifle and drop right to my knees in the slush, snatching up the cube in both hands. The hardware twinkles at me like a handful of rubies and diamonds, but this is worth more than gemstones, maybe a lot more. The woods are even darker now, and the pretty colors of this thing are flashing in my eyelashes like Christmas morning. The light it makes is hot against my cheeks, it's warming up my fingers through my gloves. And up close, I can tell it's making real quiet noises. A flow of static, like the breath of wind over a creek bed full of dry weeds. Shh, says the cube. Well, I'm listening. I can't quite remember how it got this cold this fast. It feels like maybe the world is taking two breaths to my one. Like things are jumping forward every time I blink my eyes. And now the strange light is getting downright hot on my skin and my cheeks are feeling baked. All the snow's melted out of my whiskers and water is seeping down over my little double chin and dripping off. Or hell, is that my own slobber? Either way, I don't wipe it off. The flashes and swirls of color are growing up big and shrinking down small now. And for some reason it strikes me as funny. I grin through my wet beard at the little dancing streaks. Spook light. The word sneaks up through my brain like water through granite. And a chill courses down between my shoulder blades. It hits me that I'm a man down on his knees and all alone in the black woods with a bobble in his fingers. It keeps on touching me with its light, putting whispers into the air, the whooshing voice of the deep black ocean and a seashell, and I swear it's saying something. I promise. I always thought the spook light was just a story, but now I know it's real and it's right here in my hands. My mama told me she saw the spook light out on the Oklahoma 50 East Highway. She was dating a boy from down there in the little border town of Hornet, Missouri. Legend in Hornet was that the spook light showed up after the trail of tears come through. Thousands of men, women, and children near the end of a forced march. Only the strong still alive, 
little babies dying on their mama's teeth, and most of the sacred elders gone off alone in the night to pass on. For a thousand miles, day and night, it was the rifle or another step forward, and both as deadly as the other. The legend was that this ball of light came folding out of the blood-soaked ground after it was over, like a kind of tombstone. Something from beyond this world, here to offer a reminder of how much men can suffer. Maybe this spook light is the same. Is it here to mark our loss? God knows that men suffered in these woods. Mama didn't trust it. More than once, she told me to run if I ever saw a spook light. That didn't scare me one bit, because hell, I thought her stories were just a bunch of old malarkey. She was full of those kind of tall tales, and my mama told me that same one plenty of times over the years. It never gave me pause but once. One time, Mama added something to the story. It was late and I'd been acting up, and she must have been feeling worried about my mortal soul. The way she said what she did that night, so earnest, it put goose pimples on my ribs. It still does. What she told me was that the time she saw the spook light, people started acting funny. Walking toward it and circling around, saying strange things to it, she said. And some people thought I was saying strange things back. That night, my mama took me by the arm and she told me something extra. Don't pray to it, she said. And the back of my neck went cold. I already told you to run away if you see it, boy, but I know your mind. And you'll stay and watch. That's fine. It's in your nature to disobey, Hank. But promise me that you won't ever get down on your knees and pray to it. With everything I got, I forced my hands down. My joints are cracking, and I figure they haven't moved in hours. That raw light leads my face, and I take a shuddering breath like a catfish in the well of a boat, because the air out here is suddenly so cold. I will myself to drop the cube into the snow. There, Mama. I start to paw at my rifle. It's slung tight, and the strap, the strap is stiff and frozen, and I'm too fat to get it around right away. These woods are going to swallow me up if I don't get out of here right now. And then I hear the noise. At first I don't want to believe it, so I keep right on fidgeting, but the second time I have to stop. It ain't like I want to, but I can't help myself. And I look down at that flickering cube of light in the snow. Hank, says the spook light. And that glow, it spreads out, you know? Like the words themselves, the light spreads out around the edges of things. No, I say, and it comes out a whimper. I've got the rifle off my shoulder now and I'm tugging at the cold metal to try to get into a firing stance, but all the strength is out of me. I feel like my bones are empty, like my gut is made of paper mache, and any second I might bust open. I've got secrets to share with you, Hank. So much wisdom, I promise. Let me open up your eyes. All you have to do is say yes. Something tickles me, and I reach up to feel my cheek. My fingers come away shining with a layer of ice. No, I'm crying. I'm crying real hard and I can't stop because I'm about to disobey my mama. I promised her, but this is too hard. Don't you ever pray to it, Hank Cotton, she told me. Please, I'm saying to the light, please. But the spook light is talking to me, around the edges. Edges I can't see, but I can hear. It's a little burning bush in the palm of my hand. I don't remember picking it up. You're my chosen one, Hank, chosen to rise above the rest. Yes, I say. And I could swear I'm standing still, and the world is moving around me, walking now, columns of trees marching around me, snow kissing my boots, moving me out of these woods and back to the campfires, back to the world of men. I can feel the bare tree limbs arched high up above me, black as rifle barrels and creaking in the arctic wind. But I feel warm now, warm all over with this keen light shining on me again. My strength is back, and it's still growing. I'm marching out of these woods strong as a bull with this spook light in my hand, and a big old grin has found its way onto my face. It's mine. The light is all mine. And that's the end of the